All right, so now we're going to look at some operations that we can do with the ternary phase diagram to get some useful information out of it uh, and so forth. All right, so the first thing that we could do um, is we have a ternary phase diagram. And if you think about it, that also means that we have three binary phase diagrams, right? So if we're thinking about our iron oxide, uh, silicon oxide, uh, aluminum oxide system, that means that we have a uh, silicon dioxide, aluminum oxide system, and that's represented by this sort of uh, uh, side of the triangle between them. Same thing for any of the sides of the triangles. Those effectively represent a bi binary phase diagrams. And so in the supplemental reading, um, if you want to go through it, um, there's actually a process where you could um, go through and basically recreate the binary phase diagram uh, of any two components in this. Um, I think this is a little bit beyond what we need to do out of this. I think all I want you really to recognize is that you can do it, uh, but typically binary phase diagrams are much more readily available. So I'm going to assume that if you want that information, you can find it in another source. But one thing that is quite useful is the construction of an isothermal section. And so, like I mentioned before, uh, when I first mentioned this, all these lines represent um, the temperature contours of the liquidus. And so we have this sort of projection of all of those, um, of all that three-dimensional shape onto a two-dimensional space. But if you're looking at a system you may only be interested at a particular temperature for the system, and then just interested in that one slice of the diagram to have a, a more easy view of what's happening at that temperature and then a given composition in that temperature. And so it's often useful to construct isothermal sections from a ternary phase diagram. This can just help simplify things with isothermal sections. All right, so what we're going to do, the first thing that we're going to do when we construct one of these isothermal sections is whatever temperature we're looking at, so this example is 1600 degrees Celsius, we're going to find the temperatures, the temperature contours of the liquidus that match that temperature. So this uh, first case here, I'm highlighting the 1600, and then all these other sections of the temperature contour in each of these. So again, um, I'm just highlighting the temperature contours that match 1600. Keep in mind that you see some breaks here, right? Uh, for where uh, it has different sections. So here, here, here uh, are some of the breaks that we see in the section. That'll be useful when we get to another section of this. All right, so we can just sort of isolate that portion and plotted over here, right? So we see that we have uh, already kind of simplified matters because we've gotten rid of all the other temperatures that we're not uh, interested in. All right, so when we're looking at this, um, if we think about all the stuff in the middle, if you look at all these temperatures, all those temperatures are below, all these temperatures, If it's a little, uh, if it's a little small here, but go back. you can go back to the previous slides and look. But all these temperatures that you're reading in this uh, region uh, within the red lines uh, are lower than 1600 degrees. So that would mean that if you're within these red lines um, at 1600 then, then anything in that composition range would just be liquid, right? So I've made that and represented that as liquid because anything, all the temperatures there are lower than that. And so we're above it. And so that means we have a liquid. All right, so the next parts of these are going to be what these other regions uh, around it. So what does this represent? What does this and all this represent? And so with that, it's important to keep in mind that these temperature contours represent the liquidus, and the liquidus is always uh, liquid above it and liquid plus solid below it. And we know which solids based on 
the boundary curve, or sorry, not the boundary curves, uh, by the primary phase fields, right? The primary phase fields were labeled in these cases. So up here, uh, it might be a little hard to read, but it says Cristobalite. So this was the primary phase field for Cristobalite. And so uh, this line intersects it, right? So over here we have liquid, but when we get to the other side, we have liquid plus Cristobalite because we're at a temperature below, uh, we're at 1600 degrees and this temperature up here was higher than that. And so that gives us liquid cris plus Cristobalite up there. And just for your reference, Cristobalite, if you look up here at the references, SiO2. So it's basically the pure component of SiO2. All right, so now we can look at the other sections. And again, there's three breaks or two breaks and three separate lines. And so for this first portion, you'll see molite. Oops, sorry. Uh, so you'll see molite. For this next part, you'll see corundum. And for this last part down here, you see this hercinite. Uh, and so that's gonna tell us what phases we have in those three regions. So let me move this to the next phase. All right, so again, I'm just showing you that sort of section here. So this point and this point uh, were kind of the, the sectioning points. So here uh, we're looking at molite. So molite was the three, two comp component, which is what's here. So we wanna draw uh, um, a tie line to that. And then um, also we notice uh, that in this region, uh, we had corundum, and corundum is basically pure uh, Al2O3, so down here. So what that means is that in this region, everything's going back to molite. So this is the, so this whole area would be liquid plus molite. But in between, you see there's a, a gap here where there's actually gonna be liquid plus molite plus corundum because in this case, it's just liquid plus corundum. And the same thing down here, this is gonna be the hercinite, but in between there's gonna be liquid plus hercinite plus corundum. And so let me go through and, and just show you the final result here. So in each of these, you'll see that there's these radiant lines, right? That means that if we think about this region, it's a two phase region, liquid plus SiO2. And so we're drawing the composition we're drawing these lines from the composition of the solid to the composition of the liquid. And this line is the composition of the liquid, right? So these lines that radiate out are basically tie lines, if you remember from binary phase diagrams. And so that's kind of how we're representing this two phase field. So the same thing in this region over here, if we draw tie lines from the liquid, so basically uh, to the liquid, from the solid, and molite was composition here, if we radiate out until uh, we get to the boundaries, and so in this case, uh, until we get to here, because that's where a new line forms, and then up to here at the top where the, the phase diagram ends. So that'll give us the boundaries, and that's how we can say that there's a gap here. Uh, because here, and if we look at this region, this is where we had a corundum, so the composition of the corundum, and then radiating out uh, along that line until the endpoints. And that gives us this uh, region here where it's liquid plus corundum. And the same thing over here, we can get liquid plus hercinite um, uh, as this region. And in between, that means that we are left with, that we have to have liquid, but also the two solids around it. So hercinite, corundum, and so those two uh, exist here. Same thing here, molite and corundum, and so those two plus the liquid are in, exist in this phase. So you have to take the composition of the solid and make these radiating lines, tie lines, uh, to this liquidus until the you know end of that liquidus line. So the breaks are here and here, and so that's why we're getting these these regions. So now. We've got this isothermal section, and it's a little bit more clear if we're just looking at one temperature, what happens, right? So if I have a composition here, 
it's going to be liquid. If I have a composition here, it's going to be liquid plus molite here, liquid plus molite plus corundum, and so forth, right? So it's a little bit more simple, and we're ignoring all the other temperatures that are of uh, less interest to us in this case. All right. So we can do the same thing, as you can imagine, at other temperatures. And so they go through and also uh, construct an isothermal section at 1300 degrees. Uh, and you'll see that, again, they followed the lines. And each, you see the strong breaks. So this is a line, 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 and a line. And so you'll do the same thing. You'll have uh, uh, the liquid is here going back to... Uh, SiO2 and all these other compositions. And you'll see that in this case, there's an additional feature where over here, we no longer have liquid. So these, um, th if this is the liquidus and we form a tie line uh, back to the solid, well, it only goes to molite and harsonite uh, and so that leaves this region here where this is only the solid phases. And so in this case, it's only molite, harsonite, and corundum, and there's no liquid. And so if we, and another interesting thing about this is that this would also uh, appear as the compatibility triangle for those three components. It's just the triangle of those three components. And so this is, uh, basically happens uh, below uh, the 1380 because that's the critical temperature for that reaction of that system. So for uh, if you look here at the sort of the guide for all the different critical temperatures, um, the first critical temperature, if you're going from highest temperature to lowest temperature, is 1380, which is molite plus, uh, sorry, liquid plus molite plus the harrisonite uh, and corundum. And so that's the first one that appears. And so that makes sense that we'll see this here if we're now doing this 1300 because we're below that critical temperature. So we wouldn't expect to see liquid in this region over here. All right. And so then if we keep going down in temperatures and we want to construct the isothermal sections, if we're below the critical temperatures of all these reactions, so... 1380, but then all the way going down to 1083, where this reaction occurs. If we're so, if basically, if we're at a thousand degrees for this system or less, then what we would expect is to see all solid, right? So these are all solid. You don't see any liquid here. And so, the other interesting thing and the useful thing here is that this is exactly the same as the compatibility triangles. This should look like the compatibility tri triangles that you draw for this system. And so the compatibility triangles are basically the isothermal section below all the critical temperatures. All right, so I've got a different diagram for you, a, a new one here. And so I want you to practice this uh, here. Uh, so. Uh, do whatever works best for you. If you want to, um, you know, print this off or if you want to kind of do it like I'm going to do on the uh, PowerPoint presentation with the drawing feature, but uh, uh, do what you need to do. But see if you can draw the 1400 degree Celsius isothermal section for the diagram below. Uh, so go ahead and pause the video and, and then I will uh, come back and I'll sort of work through this with you all at once. All right, so now we're back and we're going to draw the isothermal section for 1400 degrees Celsius on this diagram together. So let me exit out and I'll sort of draw uh, this along with you on the presentation. So uh, I've made a, a bigger one for me to help out. And the, the first thing that I'm gonna do is again, highlight basically the temperature contours that match the temp temperature of interest. So um, this is, uh, 1400 uh, one that I see and then I also see 1400 here and then sometimes you're not going to see the uh, the actual temperature but by extension since these lines connect this whole segment from here to here to there is also 1400 so I'm going to go ahead and make this 
and then this segment, and then this segment. All right, so that's the, uh, it's, it's obviously a little poorly drawn, but uh, bear with me. Uh, so this is the, these are the liquidus regions for that temperature. And so anything in between it is gonna be a liquid because we're um, at temperatures uh, below the temperature that we're interested. So everything in here is gonna be a liquid. And then everything outside, we're gonna look at our connections to the solid phase. So uh, let's start with this A phase here, AN. So this has a composition, this is the terminal phase, so it's basically the uh, composition here. So with that, we could, and let me change colors real quick, um, draw tie lines from the composition, which is the corner of the phase diagram, to the liquidus. And I'm apparently using some type of uh, rainbow feature here. And I'm gonna do that until I reach the ends, right? So in this case, it reaches the ends of these diagrams. So this whole region is gonna be liquid plus this A phase. And I can do the same for the other regions as well. This um, is the liquidus for this phosphorite phase. So this is going to be liquid plus phosphorite. And so the composition of phosphorite is down here, FO. And then I'm going to draw my tie lines up uh, with this line. So this line goes from this point to this point. So if I draw a line from this point back to phosphorite, and the same thing from here, and then kind of fill in the middle just to represent all the various tie lines. Right. So this whole region is going to be liquid plus phosphorite. And I can do the same thing for the other regions. Here um, uh, in the middle section, this is this EN phase, which has a composition down here. And so I can uh, take those regions and then fill in the middle. So this in the middle here is EN plus liquid. Same thing for this last one. This is Cristobalite, which is uh, pure quartz, which is down here. And so I can draw my boundaries from the liquidus to Cristobalite and then fill in my radiating tie lines. And I apologize for that, these not being perfectly straight and everything, but you can kind of get the picture. So uh, this would be liquid plus cristobalite. So that means that in between, so we have gaps here and here. So that means that in this region, we're going to have cristobalite in this EN phase plus the liquid. And then over here, we're going to have EN phase plus the phosphorite plus liquid. And so that kind of gives us every part uh, of this diagram. So let me go to the next one where I've had a pre-drawn one so you can see it a little bit better. So I'll put this up on the screen. So here you can see a better drawn version uh, of this with all the regions labeled. So this middle region would be liquid because all the temperatures were um, lower. Um, and then all of our two phase regions uh, with the radiating tie lines from the solid to the liquidus lines and then the regions in between uh, surrounded by, with the solid phases that surround them, plus the liquid. So those are our three phase regions in between. And so this is how we can draw our primary, uh, our isothermal section for a given system.